And I will second. Ms. Nichols, how do you vote? Aye. I will vote aye. Uh, and now to the moment we've all been waiting for, and this should be a very uh, healthy meeting given the number of policies we have to review. But uh, McKenna, if you could take us through the policy updates from the North Carolina School Boards Association. Ms. McKenna, you are muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we haven't done the first half of the fours yet, um, but you all wanted to start with a student discipline. So we're start instead of starting with 4,000, we're gonna start with 4,300 where the student discipline policies start. And then we can go back to the other policies in the fours next time. So if we wanna go to policy 4,000. The, um... Since Nelson's going to leave us about 9.30, should we start with those uh, ones from technology and social media that's hanging on? That would be great. Let's, let's finish those first. Sure. And I'll be back very quickly. <laughs> well, these, um, I think, are essential to get in place. I would agree. Well, all of them are essential, but these more so. <laughs> I'm going to miss your pretty face, McKenna. Oh, I'll miss you. All right, can we pull up the first one? Is it the... 3225. Yeah. Okay, and I, I think these changes were from Ms. Stagner? Yes, and what was added was actually on the very end, the last page H, I believe. Ms. Stagner, could you refresh my memory what you wanted to add here? So these are the... Um... I don't know if we can scroll down to it, um, but the the I, I talked to Don Brinson, um, who indicated that there's an ex, um, desire to explore a gaggle, which is a online um, email filtering program, and I'm probably butchering that, but um, it it would be continuously monitoring, and so. Um, is, is there a way we can move down to the last page, scroll down to the last page? Okay, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Go back up to five, I'm sorry, page five. The right version, this isn't the right version. Yeah, it is. No, this is the that wrong isn't. Version. That is not the right version. Um, so I'll just explain it. The, if you can try to find the correct version, it was uh, 112420 was the version. Uh, but the, this will be continuously monitoring um, e student emails for certain key words, um, threats, et cetera. And it was my concern that we put in something to address the expectation of continuous monitoring of email in the privacy section of this policy. And so I drafted some language um, and that was the addition from the last time uh, the committee looked at the policy. It's under the privacy section. If you could scroll down a little bit further. Okay. So. Why is that delete? Keep going. That's not, I don't think this is it. Keep going. This, this, eight, I think. This is not the last one that we received. I'm going to pull up the, on my computer the version that um, I sent so I can be looking at it and find exactly where that. 
where that is. In the version I have, all that language that appears to be struck out in this version should actually be there. I think that was what you added. That's that's what I thought. Um, and I yeah. looked at it last night to compare with the version that Kim had sent around. Um, yeah, I don't know why that is. It starts with in the course of monitoring the online activities of individuals who access the internet. So that, I don't know how that language got um, struck through, but that's the language I added to in to just put students and parents on notice that even though the gaggle will be monitoring the emails, um, we don't want to have a false sense of assurance that we will catch everything and that the parents and um, guardians also have responsibility for supervising online activities and student safety. And this would be a concern, for example, if uh, an alert came through in the middle of the night and someone missed it or someone who was the person responsible for uh, receiving those alerts was on vacation or, you know, for whatever reason, an alert wasn't caught and something happened that there would be a concern about liability for the school district for having the monitoring and not following through on it. Um, and then there's language about encouraging training to address safety issues with online communication. So that was my addition. I, um, uh, the versions that went around last night that Kim sent were were fine. I'm not sure how that language was stricken, but um, that was what I added. Dawn, did you have anything to add to that? No, and then what you've got, um, I definitely agree with. So we're keeping all of that that has uh, been removed initially. Is that correct? Correct. In that section. I'm that. sorry, I was talking to the muted microphone. What is in purple here that's um, been struck through should be actually an added uh, language. So uh, let's go from the very beginning because some of the things that were um, taken out or appeared to be taken out uh, I think we're put back in. So on page one, are we keeping under A, the first line? No, that's going away. Okay. And we're going to use, down at the bottom, we're going to use may use page one. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay, is that may use, is that what we're going to say? Or yes. All, okay, so we need to have may use in there, McKenna. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for us to get the updated version? And who has the updated version? That was the version that was sent out yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, the version that was, was sent out was is the correct version. Yeah, the one posted is wrong, but everyone should have the correct version. Okay. And I, yeah. We can resend it though. I'll send it to Ms. Joy. I just wanted to make sure that when we post them um, for the vote, that it's the correct one that's up there <clears throat> and there's no confusion. I agree. Because I'm, I'm a little confused. <laughs> Is there a way to, to post the correct version right now or? If, if you let me share my screen, I'll pull it up. You if got I, it, give me one second. And also I can get, Chris, Crystal can post it too, if that's the. Okay, can you guys see the screen? 
Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. So we're leaving them the may use. So all that is in red is staying there. Those are all staying. And this is the section that was added. And then the warranty at the end, and that's it. Ms. Nichols, do you have anything with these changes? Dr. Faust, uh, Dawn, I'm satisfied with them. No, I'm glad to see that we've re-entered some of that information. It certainly is more helpful, I think, to, to everyone who reads the policy. Absolutely. And abides by it. Thank okay. you, Dawn. Yeah. I will stop sharing my screen. And share you. <laughs> So Nelson, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, uh, we'll hold these three until you get back or four. Are we ready for the, um, what's the? Yeah, I, um, I have time to do, uh, four, four I think five. I have time to get through 7335 before I have to take off. Okay. And then I will leave our Student policies in your ever capable hands. Oh, Mr. Right. Just for a bit. Mr. Billier, if, if you leave though, there will not be a quorum of the policy committee, um, which we're down to two at this point. So, I mean, Ms. Nichols can continue to receive the information about the policies, but if there's going to be a vote to move them forward to the board tonight, um, that will need to wait till you come back. Um, I can just be, I, if we could just take a 10 minute break, that way I can just. That, get, I, I think a short recess might be wiser. Thank you. I apologize to everybody. It's the end of the semester for us college types. Uh, it, it just, uh, I'll be very, very brief. So, I mean, we can continue until 9.30. So seventy three thirty five. Yes. Dawn. Okay. So um, I guess I just need to have some clarification in the second paragraph when it talks about all school employees, including student teachers and independent contractors, shall comply with the requirements of this policy. So who are we referring to there when we talk about independent contractors? So I I might um. So for example, if you have a um, physical therapist who has been contracted to work in the district uh, uh, and provide services to students, um, they may be accessing, and I, I'm not sure, I mean, that's, that's who an independent contractor is. I don't know whether, you know, McKenna can explain the thinking bet behind including them in the policy, but, um, uh, it, that's who I, I think that it might refer to. Yeah, I think the idea was if you have people who are, you, they're doing work for your school system that you might otherwise have a school employee do, but if it's, for instance, it's something where it's just not a full-time job, so you just hire someone out to do some work like that, um, 
you still want them abiding by the same conduct standards as your employees because they're still work. I mean, they're doing work. They're not working for it. They're, they're an independent contractor. They're not your employee, but they're still doing work for the school system. So you don't want them misbehaving. Okay. I guess my brain just is go to, because in my field, independent contractor, those are people that may come in and pull cable, do other things. And typically, you know, I don't see how we can police what they post in social media. We state um, independent contractors working in positions. Would that help? Well, I think um, <clears throat> this is common. Okay. I'm definitely, as they were stating, it could be speech pathologists, physical therapists, um, nurses, you know, anything that has that. I mean, we would know who those individuals are when we look at ind um, independent contractors. Um, I'll be honest with you, a lot of districts actually use this policy. Um, I don't have a, a problem with the way it reads. Unless no, there are I, other yeah, I'm fine with it now that I understand you know, all the other people that fall under that category. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sometimes it could also even be a, you know, a, a teacher. I don't know if, if for whatever reason we would ever have that, but it could be anyone who um, is working for us with um, an independent contract. Okay. So then, um, down in section A, definitions of social media, where we're listing examples, um, are we wanting to list just the most common examples that are used now, or are we wanting to, or are we just listing the examples that were created when this policy was done? The previous policies, we didn't list them individually, but had a a term that included all of them. Yeah, well, it does. It says, I mean, it does have a term. You talk about direct messaging, you know, and, I, and I'm not, I actually like the fact that examples are listed so that people understand that this is the kind of social media that we're talking about. So I'm like, okay with that. But I just didn't know if, you know, we want to remove like Flickr. Nobody uses that really much anymore. And specifically we might want to put TikTok on there since that is a very popular one right now. <laughs> Was, was my thought process. Yes, good catch. Are there any others that you'd wanna remove? I mean, you could move Google Plus cause I don't think that's even a thing anymore. Okay. Would it be wise to say include um, but are not limited to because this this will continue to change. I think so. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. And then where you list the, um, where it talks about social media components of learning management systems, instead of listing like Moodle or Edmodo, maybe we need to list the learning management systems that we use in our district and say such as Google Classroom, Canvas, Seesaw. And then other than that, I don't think I saw anything else. No, I thought section B was, was very detailed and thorough. So uh, that was, was my concern uh, before that's, I think it's excellent. Uh, Ms. Nichols, did you have anything on this policy? No, I agree with everything that's in there now that we've made the change. I, I, I do as well. 
Um, and so with that, if I could just indulge everybody's patience for a quick 10 minute break. And again, I do apologize. I will be very brief. Just take attendance, tell them to have a good Christmas and uh, we'll get back to work. Okay. So thank you very much. I'll be right back. Could you go back to that one for a second, please? Um, to the to the um, top, the, the very last item under B. Okay, so the again, this is um, language that I had added, and it appears to be struck out on Simbly. Um, I'm not sure what happened. The, there's another paragraph also that I added. Uh, these were things that I think Dennis Wooten had requested that I tweaked and, and um, sent around on the 27th um, for posting the version that I have. Those are not struck, and so I'm not sure what happened when they got posted, why my additions are now struck through. Um, Ms. Dagger, you're referring to the extent any employees use social media to yeah. the students? Yeah. Um, you know, why is, I don't know why it struck through. Um, yeah, I have that as added language, not deleted on the version I have. So, Ms. Joy, Kim Joy on the 25th of November sent around some additional language that was requested by Dennis Wooten. And I um, I think I reviewed that and then sent this version around that had that those two paragraphs added. And I'm not sure why they're not showing up again. Um, for some reason, it appears my changes were struck through. Somebody didn't like them. <laughs> I, I definitely, uh, looking at it, I don't see why it shouldn't be a part of this. Um, can we make sure to add that back in, please? And then also in D5, mm -hmm. that language there, has that been struck out too? Is there a way for us to go in and see who struck through? I know when I used to edit papers, I could see if I were. Oh, yeah, that language at D5 should be in there. This is some language that I think is in your employee handbook about expressing, you know, making note that it's uh, an expression of personal opinion and not a statement of the New Hanover County Schools. And again, Mr. Wooten had requested that that be added. Um, so I'm not sure why it's been struck through, but I would recommend that it stay. So we need to get the original one posted back. Um, and, and I've got my version again, I can send it, I can re-forward that, but I think, you know. That'd be great. So are we on our break at this time or what? Uh, I, I think so now. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. I'll, I'll be right back.
I gave him a time. <sighs> Hello, everyone. I'm back whenever everybody else is ready. I again apologize. I know that how valuable your time is. What's that? That was fast. It's got to be fast. I'm a busy man. Yes, you are. <laughs> I do apologize again. Um, but I guess 7335 is good with those changes as long as we reinsert that language. Is that correct? Ms. Nichols, what are you going to do for your retirement? I'm going to still work on Jane's health. I'm refinishing cabinets right now. But you're not on any ladders? Sometimes. Oh. I, I just did uh, crown molding the other day. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we did. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, whenever everybody comes back, we're ready. I'm back. <laughs> Thank you again, everybody. Um, I definitely appreciate the, the patience, you know, how valuable, how valuable everybody's time is. Um, so McKenna, we can put that uh, those deleted items back in 7335. Yes. All right. So if there's nothing else for 7335, uh, this will be fun. All these student policies. Um, let's begin with policy 4370, student discipline hearings. What about 3620? Uh, 3445 that are still hanging. Are they hanging? Mm -hmm. So so 3445 is is going to be held over the scholarship one until the January meeting. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about 3620. Oh yes, the extracurricular activities piece. Um, yeah, let's um, you want to go through that, McKenna? Sure. Um, so what, the issue with this one, though, I don't think we made any changes. I think the issue was you wanted to look further into um, whether or not you were going to allow homeschool students to participate in athletics. Yes. Mr. O'Brien, are you here? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, what did we decide on that? How did we filter that in? Well, the, the North Carolina High School Athletic Association does allow for this. Um, I've looked at the proposed policy. I have a couple of, of questions um, regarding the association policy and then what we have proposed uh, under 3620. I'm not sure what the how the best way to go forward is. Yeah, so uh, please share your concerns. Um, okay, so I'm on page four or five. So some of the things that we have in place um, are, are consistent with what the association recommends and some of them are um, more than what the association recommends. Under item C, um, the association indicates that they, this, the homeschool student does, does have to be at grade level as measured by some sort of national standardized test um, I guess what I'm looking at there is, as we say, prior to the first state of practice, the student must provide the results. I wondered if we might want to put prior to the first game or first contest. I'm fine with that. That just gives a little bit more flexibility for them to, um, to get appropriate paperwork in. And is that in keeping with the recommendations of the, the association? 
the association just says that homeschool students must be on grade level according to a nationally standardized uh, achievement test indicating grade level. So okay. it doesn't give us a time. It just says that they have to, to be on there. And I would think that this is probably something that most homeschool students would come in with, but it is definitely something that they have to have. And I would say that they need to produce that by the first contest. And if they can't produce it, then obviously they would not be uh, eligible for participation based on what I'm reading from the association and from this policy. Okay, that's fine. Uh, any objections to that, Jeanette? No, that's good. Ms. Stagner? Well, I, um, I, I just pulled up my notes from the last meeting and I had uh, written that there was going to be a review of the bigger question of dual enrollment of homeschool stu students. And I'm not sure um, who was going to bring back information on that or whether it's been done yet or not. But I, I do think that that's a, that needs to be, um, or this policy should be in the context of that, that larger question about whether that's going to be permitted. And I think McKenna, if I'm correct, that's something that needs to be in place um, before this type of policy could be um, added. Yeah, yeah, and it would seem like um, you probably need other policies about how you're going to allow that dual enrollment before you can do the athletic component. It was it was my understanding that we have allowed recently uh, homeschooled students to participate. That that was something that the state uh, did allow for. The State Athletic Association does allow for um, the homeschool students to participate, but the question is, are you even allowing the homeschool students to be dual enrolled in the first place? We have allowed some students to dual enroll for this purpose. That is correct. So probably within the last year or two years since this policy became uh, available through the High School Athletic Association. So I wouldn't say that we have a, a large number, but I think that we do have um, two or three scenarios where we have allowed for this. And, and so the issue is that you're you, you really need to have a policy in place for the dual enrollment um, first. And then if a student is duly enrolled under the board's policy, then you can allow the athletic participation. But the athletic participation piece sort of puts the cart before the horse. And um, in the absence of those other policies to give structure to the dual enrollment process, it, it's sort of an ad hoc thing that I think is problematic. Um, and so I, again, I, my understanding was, uh, I think from McKenna's notes last time is that there is no existing policy in place to address the larger question of dual enrollment. So do we need to push this back until we have that policy in place? So I think one option would be to, to do that, to hold this completely, or to, the second option would be to ad adopt the policy as um, revised to, to strike the to strike this home school student portion. And then if a structure is in place later, that could be added back in. Well, I definitely would like to add that structure as soon as possible because I don't want to. Mr. Brown, students who are due enrolled right now, aren't they anticipating to be able to participate once again? Yes, sir, I do believe that that's the case. And I would have to check to see what that actual number is. Um, like I said, I, I'm, nobody has presented um, this year for that, but that is possible that we could have somebody in um, from previous years. Many times when the kids come in, um, they, they come in for a semester and then um, typically by the second semester or maybe the next school year, sometimes they, they fully enroll with us. So they, they are no longer a homeschool student at that point or a dual enrolled student. They, they fully enroll it sometimes down the road. That doesn't happen in every case, but, um, and again, I would, I would suggest that it's a pretty small, um, a pretty small, small number of, of students that we have participating. Yeah, I, I understand that. Like I said, though, these are taxpayers. Um, I've long thought that they should have a right and I wouldn't want to strike all of this and then 
have you know even two or three students come to participate and be told, yeah, I'm sorry, we changed the policy. Um, so if we strike all this, wouldn't that disallow any homeschooled participation until we can come up with a framework? Um, you currently don't have this in your policy, so it would actually, I mean, not, you're not, you're striking it from the version that we're sending you, but you're not striking it from what is in your current policy. So not including that language in what you adopt doesn't change anything from how you've been doing it in the past. Okay, so for the time being, it would have policies on all this. Yeah, so I, I think what McKenna is saying is you currently are doing all of this with no policy at all. Um, and so, you know, it, it's better to adopt some policies to provide structure, but um, nothing that you're doing now is going to be impacted if this policy is adopted to to just include the other extracurricular activity portions. Um, okay, excellent. Well, then in that case, I think we should go ahead. Um, and unless there are some other objections, I think we should adopt the policy. Um, and it also, if you would just want to avoid confusion, as to, like when, when you present these to the full board, you present them in strikeout form, correct? Are you presenting? Yes. We can just remove that language. Like there's no reason because that I can understand why you're saying like that showing that language and having it struck out could lead people to believe that you're no longer allowing that when you did before. Correct. Take that language out completely and not have it appear as strike out. Thank you. That would be that would be helpful. I agree. M McKenna, do, does the school board association have policies about dual enrollment? Uh, you don't have a model policy for that. No, because we weren't even sure if it's actually permissible. We understand that the athletic association is allowing these kids to participate, but we don't see where the mechanism for doing that in the first place for enrolling them. So we were just leaving that up to schools. We had, we we're, if anyone was doing the athletic participation, we provided this language because the athletic association is saying they can, but we haven't, and I haven't actually seen any policies where people, I have, I mean, I can look, but I haven't seen that I can think of where um, people have developed dual enrollment policies for homeschool students. So So in the interim, if somebody were to present in the spring, we, we can continue because we, we currently um, are developing policy. So we can continue as we have in the absence of policy or are we on hold for future, future students that, that present for this and families that present. Um, so, you know, that's a difficult question because if you're currently allowing it, there's an expectation from the community that it will continue. Um, on the other hand, there's no authority in place, no process in place, no structure in place for which uh, dual enrollment or athletic participation by homeschool students can occur. Um, so, you know, um, it, it's a little bit difficult to, to know how that even continues if you don't have, you know, don't, don't have the process in place to to provide those guidelines. Um, so my recommendation would be to try to, to quickly get, you know, something in place and, and have it um, so that you, you at least have a structure when those students participate, prevent. But, you know, certainly um, it, it's a little bit fraught to continue to allow it if you don't have the policy or the, or the clear legal authority in place to, um, to know how to treat those students. McKenna, you said there's nothing from the school board's association that you know of that exists for something like this? The school board association definitely does not have policies for dual um, enrollment of homeschool students, no. Well, I would, I would love, and again, I know it's not many students, but uh, I would love to try to break some new ground if you're interested. Uh, perhaps McKenna and I can work on, on putting together something if we can both do some searching and see if there are any examples out there that we could build from um, and bring something back. Thank you, Ms. Stagner. Thank you, McKenna. All right, uh, that is 3620, 3445 is being held until we get more guidance there. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, 4370 student discipline hearing procedures um, I will default to uh, Dr. Faust and, uh, and Julie 
for the bulk of these. Um, Mr. O'Brien as well. Um, Dr. Faust, do you have anything here? This is okay. So, Julie, are you ready? <laughs> I'm, I'm ask, ready. May I ask okay. a follow-up question? May I ask a follow-up question back to the previous policy? I'm sorry. No, please. So on 3620, there were some other things. Was it was it just the part about homeschool that we are addressing, or, or were there other things in 3620 that we wanted to look at? Uh, I was fine with the remainder of the policy, sir. Do you have anything? Well, I just was. Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, we we have um, in this policy, um, particularly when it, when we look at athletics, and I think the athletics piece probably has influenced the other. Uh, pieces of this policy, I would think, but we we specifically state a 2.0 um, GPA and and uh, for participation in extracurricular activities. That is also not consistent with the um, the athletic association. Um, and also, if, if we're going to stick with 2.0, I would venture that we say a 2.0 or a 70, which is the minimum C, because actually you can have one or the other. Um, or not, um, so they don't always match up nicely. So you could have a kid that has a 70 average, but not a 2.0, um, or vice versa. Um, so I, I didn't know if we wanted to, to relook at that um, as a different um, as a different way to look at it. So that is not consistent with the high school athletic association policy. They so, do not require C. And I have a question about this. Are we, I've come from districts where we did the no pass, no play. Is there a reason why we don't adopt that rule? So actually our, our rule is, is more stringent. It is, uh, which the association does allow for. The association does allow for a local district to have a more um, stringent policy. And, and so we do. So the association policy just states that you have to pass three out of four uh, from the previous semester, it does not require a C average. I don't know if that clarifies, Dr. Faust. Um, I'm sorry, didn't we waive um, our concurrent policy this past that, board meeting to that's, comply that, with the high happening. schools? It'll be happening this board meeting just for this year. For this year, right, due to COVID. Okay. Are we going to have to? Are we going to have to go back and waive it again since we're passing a new policy next month? So this, um, I mean, this language that's inserted in red is from your existing policy um, that has been added into the school board association model policy. So I don't think that the requirement. Um, would have to be waived again, since it, the, if the board waives it tonight, it wouldn't have to be waived again. Um, but this, you know, you, you could certainly put this on hold for one more month if, if per, that would be preferred. Um, but I guess the bigger question is whether the language from the existing policy is what the committee wants to propose and continue with going forward or whether there's some, <clears throat> excuse me, some desire to make a change at this point. Uh, well, I guess I'd ask Mr. O'Brien and, and Dr. Faust if they feel that the 2.0 is preferable um, or if we should align with the High School Athletic Association standards. So my biggest thing is that I don't want us to, I get it with COVID and all the other um, opportunities, but I don't want it to be that and I'll say it this way, that we are not putting academics ab above um, athletics. I, I just honestly believe that we have to give students something to fight for when they are um, in school. And if we lower it so low, then there's nothing for them to fight for. So they cannot perform academically um, with a 2.0, because I'll be honest with you, what college can you get into with a 2.0? Cape Fear Community College. Hmm. Yeah, so my, my thing on this is just merely pointing out that we are, we have a more punitive policy than, than the rest of the state. I don't, I don't have a problem with, with the policy. This is the policy we've had 
um, for quite a few years. Uh, I don't disagree with you, Dr. Faust. I just wanted to merely point out that this is a difference from what the um, from what the athletic association requires. Yeah, I mean, and I go back. It's more, I guess, personal. When I was tutoring kids um, on SAT and ACT, and there was a kid who um, Texas, not Texas Longhorn, but um, Texas Christian. Um, they were giving him a full ride if he could get a 2.5 or a 750 on the SAT at that time. And he couldn't get either. I mean, we literally had to work hard. Like it was tutoring him every single day to get him because we weren't providing the, the stringent measures to get them into the school. Um, so a 2.0 grade point average, again, like if we have – if we have athletes who are talented and there is a college university that is looking at them, will they accept them at a 2.0 is my question. Dr. Faust, I think it, it, it depends. I think you're correct in that that is would be difficult to, um, to get in, but I, I think it, it, it also depends a little bit on the college, a little bit on NCAA. So, you're correct that less than a 2.0 would, would be would be difficult. Um, you were correct in that, unless it was, um, you know, a JUCO scenario or, right. um, you know, a, a, a community college scenario, which our, our community colleges do have great athletic programs as well. Um, so uh, I think you're right in, 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 in what you're saying. Um, I, I would suggest if, if, we're, if we leave that as is, I would suggest that we say 2.0, grade point average or a 70. Um, even though you would think that that would be the same, there are scenarios where that doesn't always play out. Where a kid okay. does have a numerical 70 average, but not a 2.0. Yeah, I think that would be fine. I have no problem adding that. So everywhere it says a 2.0 grade point average or better, if you wanted to say a 2.0 grade point average or a 70% or better? Yes. Okay. Dr. O'Brien, anything else? <laughs> You know, there's no initials in front of my name, but um, no, that was the only thing on those policies. All right. So, trying again. Uh, moving on. Student discipline hearing procedures. And again, Dr. Travis and Ms. Varney. All right. Um, I'm ready. <laughs> um. I'm just looking at the version that's up. This version on the screen looks different than the version I have. Uh, I think this is 4370. Are we starting with 4300? <clears throat> Good. Um, I, was, I was starting with 4370. Oh, okay. Oh, we're gonna mix them up. We've, I was just going in the order that they that we've received them in. Uh oh. <laughs> Forty three hundred is the first. Yeah, I think they start at the bottom. Forty three hundred. Okay. Well, I, I, I can flip them around. <laughs> Forty three hundred it is. This policy meeting might be an exercise in stamina today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Um, what she was saying, though, about 4370, it looked like what was happening with those other policies was happening again, where the stuff that I had added in was appearing as it was struck out instead of being added. So I don't know if that happened in all of them or, or how it happened. But yeah, is it, is it possible that 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 the correct versions and, and yeah, 4370 did not look correct, but I guess, I mean, no. certainly I can move on with the others, but I'm wondering well, about the version that we have loaded. So can you scroll down on 4300 and see in um, 
Section D. So yeah, see, look, it, everything that was added is appearing as though it were removed instead of. I wonder if it's an issue with assembly. Um, or maybe the settings, uh, are the settings on your Word having stuff that appears, that's supposed to be appearing as an addition, appearing with a strike through? Although this, this is being a PDF. But if on her computer before she uploaded it, her settings are messed up or are different with um, the, sh the track changes, it could be appearing that way. Hmm. Yeah, all this stuff that has the strikeout through it is actually, it should be added. So if, if, if I don't know if everyone has the version McKenna, that you sent in a zip file, if it's possible to somehow get that pulled up and share screen instead of using Simbly, because I'm afraid all the ones in Simbly are going to have issues. Yeah. And, and if we go directly to the version that McKenna sent in a zip file, um, we can at least move through the, the policies and then adjust the Simbly issue before the meeting tonight. I don't know, McKenna, do you just want to share your screen? Yeah, you yes. Um, I don't, I mean, I would need, I need, hmm, let me see, maybe I can share my screen, sure. I, um, okay, let me try again. Yes, here we go. Okay, um, do you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so yes, yeah, so this is 4,300. Um, I did add some stuff down there, as I mentioned in D about consequences, different um, consequences that you had in your current code of conduct or in your current policies that we didn't have it here. Um, other than that, there weren't any changes to this. Dr. Faust, did you have anything on this? Not on this one. This one I'm, um, I'm good with. I do, actually. Mm -hmm. um, right. So um, I'm wondering if in section D, consequences for violations, we want to mention our school justice partnership, um, our interagency governance agreement, um, which uh, includes a, um, a graduated response um, system for infractions. I feel like this, the, the overall 4,300 might be the best place to mention that. And I can help come up with that language if that's helpful. Um, I just, I just wondered. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I can see McKenna's face. Maybe I can show mine. <laughs> um, so, being that that is an interagency governance agreement that we have with our um, school justice partnership agencies, I just felt like this might be the place to add that. And then the, um, unless there's any concern with that. Um, and then regarding the um, serious violations section um, on page four, the last part of D, um, it, in having a discussion with Jarrell Lewis, our uh, Title IX director, it really seems like we might need a statement regarding um, Title IX offenses. Um, and he has drafted a statement uh, that's pretty much um, as follows for matters involving sexual misconduct. And then he gives examples of sexual harassment, sexual assault, dating violence, um, domestic violence and stalking, refer to board policy 1725, Title IX sexual harassment, prohibited conduct and reporting process before taking action. Um, and then 
um, certainly would need to add um, a cross-reference to Title IX sexual harassment um, policy and the grievance process because the, um, the responses to those serious violations would be a bit different. Sure, yeah. If you could send me his specific language too, I'll add mm -hmm. that. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And in his, I just wanna make sure um, to be clear, in his, he is suggesting the different policies from 4,300, um, probably about 12 or 13 policies that we would add that to. So I'll, it, I don't know if we need to review that um, or if I can just send that to you for consideration, McKenna. He wants to add that language to 13 different policies. So 4300, 4301, 4302, 4303. It's the same um, series of um, policies where there's a range of consequences for certain um, behaviors. It's kind of like using that same language. I don't know what you think about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's no harm in adding it. I don't, I don't know that some of those policies, it would seem like it, sexual harassment isn't actually falling under those policies. It would fall under okay. sexual harassment. Okay. I mean, okay. There's no harm in adding that. Okay. Maybe, um, Julie, if you could just point those out when we get to the policy and the Perfect. committee um, mm -hmm. can decide whether it's appropriate in that place or not. That sounds uh, good. And these are going on for first reading tonight. So I think that it might, I, I believe, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if they are, then we should probably make a note that, that there are going to be some changes or they should be um, held up till the next meeting. I guess what I'm saying is if all the changes are not going to be incorporated by the board meeting, then we probably should either make that known or, um, or hold up. Maybe. I would recommend hold off on. Yeah. It, it, Dr. Faust, am I correct that these are on for first reading tonight? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, the 3000 series is first reading for tonight. The 3000. Okay. 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 Good. I'm sorry um, for the confusion then. So then we should be able to get those incorporated before the, the first reading. Thank you for that. Yeah. I was beginning to panic to think <laughs> that I was offering revisions too late. No, I had to look it up. I looked it up. Thank you. Thank you, Don. You have a, a question on a different part of this one, if, if I may. On page three, I'm sorry, Julie, were you finished with your, your portion? Um, yes, almost. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll go after you. No, the only other thing was um, mentioning um, when my team and I reviewed this, um, wondering if we needed to reference definitions in maybe an administrative regulations document, like an... Um, in our current 8410, we have a section of definitions where we specifically define um, offenses and, um, let me see, let me grab it, where we've got the definitions for a fray or fighting, insubordination, um, school official, that, that type thing. Um, and we have found that to be very helpful. I'm just wondering if that's something that we can still consider keeping in there um, or if that's, and maybe that's what would actually go into a student code of conduct handbook. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Go ahead, Mr. O'Brien. I just had a question on page three um, where we're talking about minor violations of the code of student conduct. And maybe I should read this last sentence where it says other disciplinary measures or responses may include but are not limited to. I guess my concern was down on B. Is that something we're allowed to do? Are we allowed to allow parents to actually, is that a practice that we, we, we typically do to allow them to attend in classroom when there's a disciplinary concern? I don't think it's a common practice. And I think that there are certain situations where that's not appropriate. Um, there have been a couple of situations where I've known that to be done. Of course, it can't be done in a, in, um, a situation where there might be um, confidentiality, such as a um, exceptional children's classroom. 
I think that was my concern more than more than anything. But I just and again, it doesn't say you have to. It says may include, but are not limited to. But I just wanted to to make sure we were okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm fine with that being removed. I wasn't. Um, I mean, my my team and I didn't um, focus on that one, but I'm I'm really fine with that being removed if that was something that was just added because it's an 8410. And I think that's exactly right. These are these are things that McKenna has pulled over from your existing policy, but now is a great time to sort of look with fresh eyes at those things that have been in the policy for a long time and see if they still make sense. Mm -hmm. I would I would agree with um, um, removing that one. And. And then also on page four, and, and maybe I'm just not looking at this the right way, the last two, R and S, we have disciplinary reassignment and placement in an alternative school. Mm -hmm. um, is that just like if you have a short-term suspension and maybe you're you're doing your days at a, at a different school? Is that where that's covered, Julie, do you think? Um, actually, our disciplinary reassignment would um, be typically what we do with a long-term suspension recommendation, where we um, offer and assign that alternative learning assignment, not really an ALP, but um, because that process is a little bit different by state board policy, but a disciplinary reassignment is pretty much what our long-term suspension program at JC Rowe is. And then um, S, placement in an alternative school, um, can be different than that process. That can be the alternative alternative learning program process that the state board outlines with um, parental and school agreement based on a referral and not necessarily related to a disciplinary offense. Yeah, I guess the reason I bring it up is that these are, that's kind of what I thought as well, but these are listed under minor infractions or minor violations. You know what yeah. I mean? That seems like the, uh, it seems out of place that these are under a minor infraction area versus what they're typically used for. Well, and I think um, I think under a disciplinary reassignment, that can also be that short-term suspension process that we have okay. outlined with JC Rowe as well. Thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, could you add um, placement in an alternative school or program? Would that clarify? Under G. And going right, back to going back to parental in, uh, involvement, why don't we just take out such as conference, and that way parental involvement could include all kinds of um, working conditions for them to resolve it. Yeah. This conference is pretty much a given, I think. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah, I think conference serves them are an important part. I agree, Ms. Nichols. And Ovi, since you're on, let me ask a quick question. Um, where it talks about the school shall create a student behavior management plan that elaborates further on processes for addressing student misbehavior and use of intervention strategies, and it goes on further. Um, wouldn't you think that could be incorporated into the school improvement plan through NC Star? I do, and and I think likely they're they're probably in a student handbook as well. Mm -hmm. I would think that each high school would have that in their student handbook. Okay, and this does outline that we would have a district wide manual for that and so we would um, offer a um, template for that handbook. I agree. Okay. All right, does anybody have anything else on this one. All right, so with those changes, I guess we can go ahead and push that one forward. On to 4301, Authority of School Personnel. All right. Okay. Should I just share all these? 
I'm assuming here. Okay. Thank you, mm -hmm. McKenna. And if you need me to, I can. Um, but if you've got them, that'd be great. And I'll just pour through them and talk through them. Okay. <laughs> Oh, and 4301, I did not have any suggestions um, for any changes. Well, that's pretty easy. Uh, Ms. Nichols, yeah. did you have anything? Uh, I did not. I'm glad to see that the red was not taken out. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on to 4302. Um, I do want to mention that in 4301, um, that would be where we would add that language um, of Title IX for the um, before taking action to refer to Title IX policies. And I think that would fit there, McKenna, don't you think? In 4301? Mm -hmm. um, this policy really, I don't, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't put it in here just because this okay. is talking about really, it, it's just... It's not talking about discipline specifically for specific things, but I mean, again, if you want it in there, there's no harm. Um, I'm just looking at Jarrell's recommendation, but I, I mean, I certainly appreciate the um, the discussion. And I, and I think also the, the logic behind that is that with our Title IX policy um, being um, a focus and a priority for us and um, taking those actions. I think he's looking for every area to make sure that we are um, reminding folks to refer back to that process. So maybe that, and, and so maybe that's just a discussion for the group. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think um, it does seem a little redundant to have the same language repeated in all of those places, but if there is a concern that people aren't going to be looking to the Title IX policies when they really should be, then if that would be helpful, you think, to have? I don't think that would be helpful. I think what needs to happen, actually, is we train. Um, we need some real solid training on Title IX, and then individuals would know how to to follow it. I don't think it's necessary that we put it in every one of our um, policies. Again, like I said, we, we have to train, train people to know what to look for. Okay, that sounds good. So that was all I had for 4301. All right, uh, 4302, school plans for management of student behavior. So this is the one where um, it, I'm wondering if we want to mention the alignment to school improvement plans. So it says each, the very first words, each school must have a plan for managing student behavior that incorporates effective strategies. Um, I think the wording is great. I think that um, while training, we may want to mention that it um, would fall under the school improvement plan, but um, I don't know if we want to mention the school improvement plan in that first paragraph. Dr. Faust, do you have any thoughts on that? Mm. I don't. Um, I just don't want it to seem like there's a separate plan somewhere that's kind of a, a dangling plan. Um, next in components of the plan, um, where it mentions the um, plan should address the process by which student behavior is addressed, including any use of disciplinary committee. I would suggest that we adopt an MTSS language for that. So the use of a multi-tiered systems of support committee, because we don't really operate disciplinary committees, but we definitely operate um, um, MTSS um, systems. Does that sound good to everybody? I think that would be excellent. Okay. Can I write that correctly? Yes. Perfect. And that is all I have for that one. 
Anybody else? Okay. Do, um, the, do the board members on the committee have any um, feedback, I guess, on, on Julie's suggestion about adding the school improvement plan to the first paragraph? And, and Julie, did you have specific language? Um, I, I think it could be um, each school must have a plan and then maybe comma incorporated into the school improvement plan for managing, you know, just put comma incorporating into the school improvement plan. Because I think that also um, handles the process for developing and evaluating the plan that's down below in B, because that would be the same process for how the, um, the school improvement plan is managed. I think that would be fine. Mm -hmm. And then the part about, because at below it talks about the principal shall report it on an annual basis to the superintendent. And that's also resolved through the school improvement plan process. It really sounds like it's talking about the school improvement plan. Did I do that correctly in the first paragraph? I think so. I think that looks good. Again, and we may want to say into their school improvement plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, into it's okay. There, yes, agree. Oh, probably yes. it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Or that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And don't let me do all the talking. I have thoughts, but they're not the only ones. <laughs> <laughs> so are we good with that one anyone else so does each school have a multi-tiered um, committee yes okay consisting of whom parents as well as employees Yes, um, at certain levels. So um, every student in the district, every student in a, in a multi-tiered system is in tier one. And so um, tier one meetings are pretty much grade level and data discussion. But by the time they get to tier two and tier three, they're involving the parents. Okay, good. All right. So uh, 4302R. Rules for use of seclusion and restraint in schools. And I imagine, Ms. Varnum, you will probably be taking us through this one as well. Yes. Um, this one is very straightforward, matches House Bill 1032 very well. Um, the only question that I have are um, on page five. So um, let's see, seven, under seven. And moving on to page 5B, notice to parents, it, there's a reference to subsection G1, and I did not find subsection G1. Yeah, sorry about that. I changed the format and I missed that. Um, I, fix I that. looked and looked. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we just recently, we this, the these administrative regulations now should be formatted as regulations instead of as policies and it had been formatted as a policy and I tried to quickly format it as a regulation and I missed the internal reference. Okay, so G would be. Um, I think there's also a reference to G3. And that's yes, there, there is down below. Okay, I'll fix that. So G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G would be seven, seven C. Is that correct? Um, listed in. Oh no, wait, that's a, yeah. no, that wouldn't be right because that'd be below it. So yeah, sorry. G one would be um, seven A. G three would be seven C. Okay. Yes. Didn't catch. Sorry about that. So G1 is 7A and then G3 is 7C, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
was a good test. <laughs> Were those the old, that was the only time you caught any internal? Yes, I didn't find any others. Okay. All right, I'll double check it though. Thank you. And that's all I have on that one. This one right. follows the statute, so there's really not mm -hmm. much to do. Yes. It's just like reading the 1032. <laughs> yeah. All right, 4303, fair and consistent discipline administration. So on, on this one in section A, um, one, the board directs the superintendent. Um, and I get the language in this one, but I have a question about there are many places throughout these policies where it, um, mentioned superintendent and then says superintendent or designee and it, I, I thought thought that it seemed a little inconsistent and so I felt like we might have to determine where intentionally where we are mentioning designee. Now this one because the board directs the superintendent that one's probably um, that would probably make sense. Yeah I think it starts with the superintendent. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, on, on this one, I don't, I don't see anything other than um, just noticing areas where um, if this goes into policy, of course, we would, you know, provide the board the discipline data submitted. It's not generally something that's been done, but I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So are we sticking with Superintendent and designee, what are we doing here? On 4303, I think it makes sense to leave it as superintendent. And I'll just know in these areas that I'll be providing that for Dr. Faust. Um, there are other areas where I have questions more about where it says designee. So this policy seems fine for me. Ms. Nichols. I agree. Okay, 43. 03 on for first reading. So no changes to that one? No. All right, and up next is 4307. I just wondered on this one, um, if the word should be afforded instead of accorded under second paragraph, all students with disabilities will be accorded all rights. So that should be afforded all rights. I think afforded is better. Deborah, or Ms. Dagger, what would be proper legal language? I think that they're really sort of synonyms, but either one um, would be fine. I, I don't I don't think that there's a, a difference. Um, I mean, accorded, the bestowed, permitted, um, afforded, I, I mean, they're all sort of synonyms. So, you know, it's really a matter of preference. Then I'm fine with it. There's no need to make a change. As long as it still fits. Want to change it, Mr. Ware? Yeah, I think we should change it. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, going once, twice, 4310, integrity and civility. I don't have any recommendations for changes on this one. I was just curious uh, with regards to plagiarizing if we wanted to strengthen that language a bit. Maybe adding the words either knowingly or unknowingly in there. Is 
that would be in A, section three. I assume you're thinking that sometimes this happens and kids um, do this unknowingly, correct? Like they, they, they don't know the, the proper procedure or, or they unknowingly put something in a, a, a paper that they, they don't um, cite correctly. Is that what you're thinking? Yes. I, I, I think that for most, um, or for many of these types of violations, it is a part of the violation is an intent to do something wrong. Um, and if, if someone is, you know, walking down the hall and bumps into you and knocks you down and it's an accident, it's different than someone pushing you down intentionally. And, and I'm not saying that it's, you know, you, you can't have um, things that are unintentional be subject to discipline or or encourage them um, to be careful about doing things. But I don't, you know, um, I would just point that out that in many of, you know, forgery has an intent. Um, cheating obviously has an intent. So just that would be my only point to just think about that. It, whether it's more of an educational um, issue to teach students how to properly use resources and research materials um, to create their thoughts and, and distinguish that from plagiarizing by intentionally copying. Um, Ms. Dagner, this is uh, LaShawn Smith, and, and I would agree with you. Um, I think that if it was done um, unknowingly, then um, from my perspective, we would want to use that as a teaching opportunity for students. And then also understanding that these policies govern students um, essentially through um, kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, so if there's not the ability to have some distinction on grade level, then I would um, be hesitant to hold um, kindergarten, first, second, and third graders to the same standards um, as we would um, students in the upper grades. Okay. Excellent yes, point. And, and the fact that the last section talks about a range of consequences that may be imposed, um, and we know that, that each infraction will go through an investigation process that includes the um, intentionality and culpability, I think that those things could be hashed out. Um, so I, I would agree. All right, that's, that's excellent. I probably look at this stuff differently from an educator perspective at the higher levels. So I appreciate you guys uh, walking me through that. Thank you. Uh, if nobody has anything else, I'm fine with the rest of 4310. All right, moving on to 4315, uh, disruptive behavior. I don't have any recommendations for changes on this one. Okay, Miss Nichols. No, thank you. This one seemed pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. <laughs> Forty-three sixteen. Well, you have a lot to say on this one, I think, Mister Boyer. <laughs> <laughs> your committee spent a lot of time with it. Yes, it certainly did. So uh, student dress code. Okay, let me get this pulled up. Well, while McKenna is um, pulling that one up, um, sorry to, to go back to the other one. I was trying to shuffle too many policies here in one time. Um, <laughs> The language and disruptive behavior uh, under two re references the dress code and it says um, appearance or clothing that violates a reasonable dress code adopted and publicized by the school. And I, and I wonder whether it makes more sense to include just the reference to the board's dress code policy in that section. Um, 
because because it's really just repetitive and it seemed a, a little confusing to me to read it to hear have a reference to a school dress code and then a reference to the board's dress code which incorporates the same thing do you want to just actually eliminate all of it and just say appearance or clothing that violates policy 4316 student dress code that that was that was what i was trying to get at thank you <laughs> <laughs> That sounds good. We should change that in our policy too. That's a good suggestion. So um, I'm not sure if uh, we had a dress code committee as most of you know, and we came up with a lot of different changes. Uh, I would personally love to strike uh, number six, uh, uh, but I, I don't know how the rest of the board would feel about that, doing it without going back through that committee process. Uh, I guess my question is, would that be appropriate to make changes now, given that we had that committee, Ms. Stagner? I don't, I don't unfortunately know the history of the dress code committee, but certainly I think that this policy committee is the current existing committee to make recommendations to the full board. And um, so I, I don't have a problem with making changes if this committee determines that it's appropriate and wants to send something to the board and then there can be a full discussion by the board. I think the mid thigh, um, piece is fine in terms of accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish. There was some uh, gender neutral language that the committee added. Um, McKenna, I can get that for you, but I would like to see that added to this policy as well. Okay. So Nelson, are you saying keep number six as is? I would personally like to get rid of number six leggings are just what a lot of middle school kids wear and I don't see them as impacting the you know the quality of my kids education and elementary my eight and ten year old dress exclusively in leggings mm -hmm. yeah that, that one uh, and I know we've had some issues before um, where you've had kids dress coded and it's you know, uh, I would prefer to see this uniform. I don't know if there's a way we can um, limit the stricter dress codes enacted uh, by our middle school principals. I don't know if Dr. Faust would even have an appetite for something like that, but each middle school has a different dress code. Oh, wow. So, that is, so. Ab is that absent or does it fall in line with what the, the the board policy is when you say the, the middle school because I I didn't even realize there was a policy because when you walk the buildings you don't <laughs> <laughs> I've seen shorts that are I mean <laughs> that are extremely short um, yeah so I didn't yeah I'll just stop there <laughs> so I, I don't know about all the middle schools I know Myrtle Grove adheres strictly to the the board policy uh, my daughter's school Trask you know, they're very regimented in terms of what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, and I know there was an issue of dress down days. Uh, they would charge students a dollar every day to dress down for the week. Um, so you know, it's, it's a big fundraiser for the PTAs. Um, yeah, but should not be a part of a, a policy. Yeah, I, I don't, I, Really agree with you, Ms. Nichols. I don't think that our, you know, our so, kids in middle school should be charged with that. Mr. Billier, the, these um, additions in red, I assume, came from the existing dress code policy, and it, it incorporates nothing of what the policy or the dress code committee proposed. And so, I wonder if it meant, doesn't doesn't really make sense to start from the policy that the old, um, you know, that the old committee, the dress code committee had already 
you know, worked through, and maybe that's a better starting point. Um, and I don't, I don't know where that might be found, but um, if you've already hashed through the leggings and the other issues, it doesn't seem to make sense to, to start from going back to square one if the dress code committee's got something that we could work from in this committee, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good point. Could we hold this until you have that policy to work from? And I think at this time of the year with, with COVID and everything going on, this would not be well received by the parents or students at this time. So I would hold it and get it in place that works. And, and another issue to consider is whether the committee wants to recommend that individual schools not have the uh, discretion to deviate from this and, and that everyone will, will follow the same dress code. Mm -hmm. So schools who require, um, or not require, but encourages uh, school colors and t-shirts and um, khakis or whatever, they can still do that separately? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I think that's a discussion to have when you when you decide what should go into the board level policy. I mean, you can have um, that, that schools can have, and it's not going to violate any of these standards to have school colors, I wouldn't think. Um, but that's almost requiring khakis is almost more of a uniform requirement and you might want to consider whether individual schools can adopt a uniform policy. Yeah, I, I, some are very close to that definition. So I think that would be a, a discussion uh, that I would like to have with the board and get the superintendent's take on that as well. And generally speaking, um, you your policies allow your schools to have more stringent rules than what your policies require. So if you want your schools to have a more standardized dress code throughout the district, then you should, pro you should probably put that in the policy that this is what the dress code is going to be and that they cannot make additional rules on top of it. And if you, if you have the, um, a different version and more recent version that your policy committee created, if you want to send that to me, I can change all of this to use your more recent language for, from the policy committee or from your um, dress code committee, if someone can send that to me. Yeah, that sounds good. It was not actually, uh, it was passed by the committee. The board never took it up because of all the things that we had going on at the time and then COVID and uh, but yeah, it's a good place to start. So if you could keep side by side so they can see the changes or whatever, because you're going to have four new board members that are going to have a big responsibility here in this particular policy. Can I bring up a, a different um, question on this particular policy? By all means. Uh, item number one, I'm wondering if we might be able to tweak the language there regarding um, ID cards. I wonder if we might tweak the language to say, instead of having display, if we could just say possess and present as requested by school staff. Because the way it reads right now, the kids are supposed to have their ID card displayed all the time. And, and while I, I think our schools try to do that, I think it's, it's sometimes um, problematic for them. Thank you for bringing that up, sir. And I was actually curious about whether we want to strike that or just get rid of 4317 because to have it in both places seems redundant. Well, especially if you're not, if it's not something they're required to actually wear, it doesn't, it's not really, it shouldn't be in this policy. So we can just take that whole thing out. Yes, please. I don't know that it's a bad idea for them to have an, a school ID on their, you know, on their person. Um, I just, I think that what I'm looking at is the actual displaying it at all times. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that factors in, but. Well, the next policy will address the fact that they have to have it. So. Okay. 
So we're going to table this um, for the time being, and we'll bring it back up next month. All right, 4317 student ID cards, and there in the first sentence it says, required to display a student ID at all times. Again, I don't, I, Mr. O'Brien, you can correct me, but it seems like you're saying we're not doing that and I'm pretty sure we're not doing that. So I think more appropriate language would be all high school students are required to maintain on their person a student ID card at all times when they are on school campus and present it as requested. Yeah, that would be my that would be my recommendation and and I feel like the um, the high school principals would would support that as well. Sorry, could you repeat that? Are required to maintain okay. a student ID card and keep the rest at all times when they are on campus okay. and present it as requested by administration. Could we say school staff? Yes. Okay. All, all high school students are required to maintain a student identification ID card at all times when they are on school campus and presented as requested by school staff. Yes. Do we want to say on their person? Is it okay if it's in their locker or somewhere else? Don't we want to have it on them? I think the goal would be for them to have it on them in case a staff member needs to know who the kid is. They could say, you know, can I see your ID, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, having it in the locker or in the car kind of defeats the purpose. So I think we want it to be on the student, but not necessarily displayed or, or hanging around their neck or like we've, we've done in past years. Could they have it in their cell phone? Mm, that's that's a that's a great suggestion, actually. I mean, if, if you could, I guess, produce a picture of it. I don't know how that sounds to the legal folks, but that makes sense. Uh, they, they well, there's a, that, that's going to come up in a later policy about cell phones, um, at which I had some comments about. So I think there's some inconsistency about not, not having your cell phone out, um, the language in that policy. But if it's technologically feasible, I don't know that there's a problem with it. Um, but McKenna, could you um, share your screen when you're making those changes so everyone can yes. see them? Sorry. There we go. And I would agree with that wording and answer some questions that I had as well. Anybody else? I imagine this one will be a great deal of fun. Um, this is 4318, use of wireless communication devices. Um, Ms. Stagner, is this the one you had some questions about? Yes, I found my mute button. Um, so in the first, um, the first paragraph, the second sentence, it says, therefore students are permitted to possess such devices on school property, so long as the devices are not activated, used, displayed, or visible during the instructional day, or as otherwise directed by school rules or school personnel. And it seems to me that it would be better to say, unless otherwise directed by school rules or school personnel, because then you are consistent with the next paragraph that says in, administrators may authorize individual students to use wireless communication devices when there's a reasonable need. So um, that that prohibition in the first part of that sentence just doesn't seem to be consistent um, with the allowance of it for some some other purposes. But whether again, and I'm not I'm not sure historically or currently how much students are allowed to or um, expected to use cell phones for any reason during, you know, are they used 
can kids pull out their cell phone to use as a calculator in math class or is it something that is they're supposed to keep it in their book bag or their locker all day until the the bell rings and they call their parents to come pick them up i, I just don't know what the actual practice is and again sort of like the dress code it varies from school to school i know it Roland Grice, they have, it's either Roland Grice or Myr Myrtle Grove, they have charging stations um, in some of their common areas. So it, it trash that don't pull it out or you'll lose it. So it all depends on the school. Um, and again, is that something that there's a need to um, make more consistent or is it working the way it is now? I mean, I think it would be, honestly, I think we just need to clean up the the wording because then we have the bring your own device and what if they are using their cell phone as their device but then we also have in here um i think honestly we're just all over the place with it i agree John, is the bring your own device? I thought that was something that we had taken out that was- um... We took the wording out as far as it's not an initiative, but yet we still allow students <laughs> when they need to bring. So, I mean, we we have not required, there's some districts that actually require students to bring their own device if they have it, we do not. So um, it's, it's not a program that says you have to bring your own device to use it. However, at the same time, um, we don't have enough devices for every student. So um, Dr. Faust is giggling and I agree with him 100%. Um, it's a lot of it's semantics, um, but he is correct that because there are some students that that is the device they use when they're allowed to use a device in class to get on the internet, look something up or to, to respond to something teachers have posted. Well, maybe then in that in that same first sentence, it should say unless otherwise allowed or directed by school rules or school personnel. And that way, it is clear that if you have permission or if it's um, something that's allowed in a particular classroom, um, that it can be done. Yeah, I would like to have something in here where we're talking about, you know, because this is pretty much you're talking about cell phones, um, even though it says wireless communications, it is pretty much cell phones we're talking about, um, where they are not to be using the 3G, 4G carrier service. Because if they're using this device and they're on the internet or they're using their 3G, 4G service, then they're getting to all that social media and into anything. I mean, nothing's filtered. They get to whatever they want to get to. And in our other policy, we said that, you know, with the bring your own device in that acceptable use, we did say that if students are using their own device that they could not use the 3G, 4G service, but it's not in here, I don't believe. I think that's a great point, Don. To um, if they're at school and they're not connecting to the school system, uh, wireless in, or internet, you know, wireless. I'm, I'm using the wrong words, but they're not connecting to the school district's system. Then they're not uh, they're not filtered, and they can access things that would not be permissible to access. Correct. Uh, one quick point, can we strike um, language that says, in, in addition, students who are driving a vehicle on school grounds may not use a wireless communication device. Um, I just don't see us enforcing that. I, I think that's really difficult to enforce. It's already against the law to operate a cell phone that's not hands-free. I just, uh, I don't think that needs to be in there. Your pol your old policy was saying even if it was hands free, they could not use it. Right, um, and again, I just don't see us enforcing that. Okay. I don't think we have a mechanism to enforce it. So, okay, Miss Nichols, uh, you have any thoughts on this?
I think that whole sentence was added about using the cell phone while driving on school grounds when the law came into effect that you're not allowed a cell phone while you're driving on the street. So I think that was added to be to kind of in some kind of compliance with the law that was out there. I don't know if we need it or not, but I'm that I believe is why it was added. I, I, I agree with the sentiment. I just like I, said, I, I don't see us having a way a way to enforce that. I think it would just well, I suppose the question is whether or not you want to um, be able to to punish. So if a student is driving and they have a cell phone uh, and they're using it in, and it, they're seen and whether that's something that you want to be able to uh, include as a, as a consequence or misconduct or whether you want to leave it entirely to as a law enforcement matter. I would prefer to leave it to law enforcement. Things have changed substantially when it comes to Bluetooth and cars. I mean, kids are just going to turn them on. Most of them are to call a friend or their parents right away anyway. And, and as I said before, I think this is a, an appropriate time to consider language that was added you know, years ago and whether you still need to have it. So, so I'm wondering uh, as well uh, in terms of language, since you just referenced that um, under B, consequences for unauthorized use, um, second sentence, first paragraph, I'm wondering if we need to reword that. I, I don't think that is, I think if a phone is confiscated, it is typically returned to the student at the end of the day, unless it is a persistent problem. I don't think that we are holding on the phones until parents can pick them up, you know, a day or two days later or that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Great catch. Uh, about that sentence, I'm just wondering if we want to leave it open to any school employees confiscating devices. And um, when my team and I reviewed these, we just wondered about the liability. So any school employee um, confiscating and then what's the liability for, um, you know, if that's lost or damaged while it's in the employee's hands. Would you like to limit that to teachers and administrators? I, I, I think so. I would entertain thoughts on that. I don't know that we need to leave it open to just any school employee though. I agree. I think uh, certainly teachers, certainly administrators. I really, like you said, they're expensive devices. Um, you don't want, yeah, you want to limit that liability as much as possible, I would think. Does that all look good, the changes? Thank you. Just where do we need to add the whole not connecting and having to use the if they're going to use it, having to use. Um... So that would go in A somewhere. Also, I wanted to ask about that. So are you, do you want to say that they're not, if they're using the device to access the internet, then they have to use the school's Wi-Fi and they may not use, they may not use their cell service to access the internet? Yes. Not limit it because what if, what, because this policy does leave open, like a teacher may give a child permission to call their parent about something. They okay, if we look at the bio, um, pair, under A, the first paragraph, where it says students and administrators may authorize individual students to use the devices for instructional purposes, mm -hmm. provided that they supervise the student during use. How about we say there, when they're using it for instructional purposes, then they're using the um, school system's Wi-Fi instead of 3G, 4G. Um, John, do you do you want to limit it though to instructional purposes or just, I mean, do you want students um, to be able to at lunchtime pull out their phone and download stuff from the internet using 4G? I, I guess that that's the question. If they're using it at school at any time to connect to the internet, they should be using the school system 
filtered very, network. Very good point. Very good point. But but and again, I may be off base on the technology. If they just want to make a phone call, that that wouldn't be affected. Correct. Correct. Okay. Let me. I'm gonna pull up. Um, okay. So the language I'm going to the language from 3225 we can just we can take that and say students who are using the using it to access the internet may yeah um, it must access the internet through school system wireless network yeah I mean that's what it is is whenever okay. they're accessing the internet whether it be instructional or during lunch or whatever the case may be. Is that adequate or do you want additional language? I mean, that reads fine to me if, if Ms. Dagner agrees. Need, um, McKenna, does it say anything about during the school day or at school, um, act, during school activities? It just yeah. says, well, it doesn't. So do you want it to limit it to, do you want that limited? I mean, I, it, it seems it seems that it's going to be while while on school premises or or um, during school activities. It's not necessarily just during the school day because it could be after school as well. I don't know. I mean, if you don't, if folks don't think it's a problem, I, I think that's fine. I mean, so all of these policies, um, it says that they all apply while on school premises or at school events and all that. So, I mean, this would apply. And the next paragraph even talks about how using it after school too, about how we're gonna limit, maybe you won't be allowed to use it on the school bus. If So, I mean, I think it would prohibit, it would say that anytime you're on school grounds, you need to be using the school's inner wireless. That's fine. Then. Is, is that practical though? I mean, when somebody goes to a football game, they can't pull out their, you know, their uh, high school senior, they can't use their 4G. I'm pretty sure they'll be using it. I'm a thousand percent sure they'll be using it. So I'm a little concerned about a policy that says, well, now you can't use your 4G, you gotta log on wireless. But does, does ours actually even reach outside? Um, and not to a football field at once. Do you want to limit it to if they're using the wireless communication devices to access the internet inside school buildings? Honestly, I would just prefer to limit it to during instructional time. I really don't have any problem with the students using um, their you know, devices if it's permitted during lunch or during a study hall, again, if it's permitted. In fact, I prefer them not use our network since we're using our bandwidth for a lot of other things right now. Okay, so then that means then they will be doing all that social media, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. That's the, that's the issue, Mr. Billy, that, that you have students who while at school, and maybe it's just saying while at school, um, because they they will be doing things um, connected that that cannot be filtered, um, and that's been a concern. Um, Don and I have talked about you know the filtering issues and the the access issues. Um, and so while students are on school grounds and under the under the supervision and care of school personnel and school system, um, that is one tool that you have to make sure they're not accessing 
inappropriate and prohibited things is to make sure that the school systems filtered internet service is being used. Uh, I understand. Would it, it wouldn't be easier just to ban those sites? I guess not. All right, thank you. Yeah, well, it's you can ban you can ban them, but you can't police that. You just have no way of monitoring and policing it unless you go through the the school system's internet. So, so maybe it's just during the school day, um, accessing the internet during the school day. I think the school day would be best. I'm wondering if in the opening paragraph, we also need to just take out paging devices. Down there still? Oh yeah, probably need to. <laughs> Thank you. I thought it was a new thing. I was gonna head out to get one. <laughs> you could probably get rid of the two-way radios too. I was gonna ask that. John, thank well, you. I mean, so actually, that's that's still been a thing that that kids have have been using. Really? Uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know you can still buy two way radios, but I I just I don't even know if you can find a paging device out there anymore. I'm not sure. Anything else on 4318? So under A, is it only the administrators that can give the students the permission to use the device or can the teachers? Do you want to add teachers? I think it'd be easier for the administrators if they weren't called to make that decision. Well, it says for personal purposes is what it was saying. The administrators is just for personal purposes and then teachers if you, administrators for instruction. But if you're in the classroom and so they would have to call an administrator to make that decision. Well, yeah, I agree with Ms. Nichols on this. I think that a kid you know, says I need to call my mom to check on a ride home or something like that. I don't know that we need an administrator. I, I would think a teacher could make that call. I would think so. I would agree. Yep. Anything else? You probably need to remove that um, parking area thing if you got rid of it down there at the bottom. Sure. You want to say communication devices since you've used that previously uh, last line or are the personal wireless communication devices um well it's a cell phone or a device so we could change oh. it to yeah All right, is that it for this one? All right, see you uh, on for first reading. 4320 tobacco use. I don't have any um, changes for this one. Ms. Nichols? No. 
Thank you. My only question about that was the um, nicotine cessation products. And I, I don't know whether that um, is addressed in a medication administration policy or whether there's a, if this is something, I'm just not as familiar with it, whether that's a prescription um, item or um, some kind of a medication. McKenna, can, can you answer that? Do you know? So I was looking into it when I was adding that language from their policy. It, I, I'm not exactly sure. It looks kind of like those products are over the counter, but maybe not, you can't sell them to minors. So mm -hmm. 18 year old students, they could be using them, but otherwise, I mean, I, I, it sounded like you couldn't sell them to minors, but I would assume a doctor could prescribe it. I don't, I, I don't know, but. So I'm just thinking, is there going to be a, an administration of medication or a, yes. so students can't, under some policy, students can't even have Advil in their purse and use it during the school day. And so if, if you're going to include a nicotine um, patch or chewing gum or something that might not be permissible for for minors to have, or it might be a prescription medication. I just wanted to be sure that there's a cross-reference at okay. least, or that maybe there's a thought about referencing um, that it might be might be limited, you know, not everyone can have have this kind of material uh, on them. Yeah, that would make, well, yeah, that would make sense. Um, so it seems like really defining legally possessing the nick the um, the pro smokeless product. So actually, if we're going to consider nick um, the products designed to help you stop smoking, if they're considered medication, then you don't really even need to have it addressed in here because you will have a policy about how you're allowed to possess medicine, and that's and being in possession of that medicine in accordance with the policy is not a violation of any of the other anti-drug policies. So we could just remove that and it will be addressed with the medicine policy. It seems, it just seemed a little um, troublesome to have it here like this without any context. And that was my, my concern. Right. The only the only thing would be um, going back to the logic of having it in here is that it not be good considered a tobacco product um, because it's defining the tobacco product um, and saying that these cessation products are not tobacco products. So if we remove it, I think that's one thing. If we leave it in and cross-reference to um, basically how they are legally possessed, then maybe that would clarify. Yeah, which way would you prefer to do it? I'd prefer to just take it out. Okay. That is easier. <laughs> do we need to have anything in here? And I'm just asking the question about confiscating um, products. I'm, I'm really thinking about e-cigs and, and, and vaping devices. Um, do we need anything about that in there or is that covered under B under consequences? Because we're, we're probably confiscating more devices like this than we are cell phones. Definitely. And I don't know if it's covered. I'm just asking the question. Wouldn't it be uh, consistent with Section D of Policy 4300? Or do we need to just, I feel like we're covered there. But yeah, I mean, I think it would be. Uh, you can add it if you want, but I don't think you have to in order to be allowed to confiscate it. Sounds good to me. All right. Anybody need a cigarette break? <laughs> Policy 4328, gang related activity. How about 25? Can you skip that one? 
25. Drugs and alcohol. Oh, yes. Drugs and alcohol. Policy 4325. The only, um, I had a couple of questions on this one. Um, so defining um, in the second paragraph, I'm wondering if we need to define direct and immediate impact because um, it goes on to say applies to students while on property, school property or school sponsored event or activity, whether on or off school property, and at any other time or place where the conduct is reasonably expected to have a direct and immediate impact. Um, you know, we, we often get into scenarios where we're trying to determine um, off camp how off campus events um, translate to disciplinary action and, and I, I find that it would be helpful to define direct and immediate impact. So uh, Jill, do we I have a uh, question before she starts? Don't we have to provide it has to be a nexus with the right. yeah with the um the the infraction in the school and Go ahead, go ahead. I'll so, let you be the lawyer. Yeah. I'll be the lawyer. Well, so you're, exact, you're exactly right, Dr. Faust. I mean, this direct and imp immediate impact uh, on the orderly and efficient operation of the schools is really the legal standard that comes from the, those cases that talk about you, you cannot discipline for behavior unless there's that nexus to the school um, operation. And, and so, unfortunately, it's difficult to define in a policy what a direct and immediate impact is. That's the legal standard. I think this is, again, one of those um, that really requires training. So training administrators on the types of scenarios and how to think through, because it's such a fact-specific case-by-case analysis of whether there is that nexus to the school um, at, for off-campus behavior. Obviously, if it occurs on the school grounds, there's not a question, but does the conduct, you know, if they're selling or distributing controlled substances off campus, what is the direct and immediate impact? Well, are they selling it to other students? Um, you know, is it bleeding over into the school day? Are they making those deals um, at school and then, and then they're selling and delivering it off campus? outside of school. So that's, a, I think, something where training of administrators is really important, but I don't know that you can define that in a policy. Um, just my two cents. Would it be, um, is, it, is it necessary to have the word immediate? Um, because I think just having a direct impact would clear up a lot of that. Well, I do, uh, again, I, I don't have those cases right at hand, but I'm I feel fairly certain that that is the language that defines the legal standard. Um, and McKenna may be able to shed more light on that. Yeah, I, I'd have to ch double check, but I'm pretty sure that that language comes from the court cases. And so part of the reason for having that in there um, is to put students on notice. Um, and again, while it, it's a case specific fact intensive analysis, um, the, the, the courts, if ever challenged, are going to look to see whether your policies put students on notice of what kind of behavior that could potentially result in discipline. I'm also wondering in the um, the second page under uh, services for students, C, a school employee may assist, assist a student seeking help with a chemical dependency problem without being required to divulge information. Um, I was just curious um, why some language about counseling and treatment it's not included in this one. Why, why we have no mention of counseling and treatment as we do in policy 4320 with regard to tobacco. Because we, we do engage in referral for counseling and treatment through our school-based partners. 
especially at the high schools through our um, Wilmington Health, Health Access for Teens program. I think that makes sense, Julie. And my, my question about that paragraph is whether, um, and I didn't have an opportunity to, to do any additional research on it, but whether there would ever be a situation where there would be a requirement, a mandatory reco reporting requirement to divulge some information. And, and I, you know, again, maybe adding something there unless required by law or something um, might be helpful. It just seems to me if a student is in danger, in, in danger ring themselves or others that there might be a mandatory reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I'd agree. So could we, could we add some statement in there about, um, you know, absent any mandatory reporting um, for safety issues, but then also add similar language um, from 4320 um, on, you know, administration consulting with uh, county health department or other appropriate organizations. I just made some changes. <laughs> Thank you, McKenna. That looks good. Is that okay? Yeah, that was, that was quickly. So I need to reread that. I just had one other minor um, suggestion, and that's in paragraph seven up above. Um, it talks about substances, and it seems to me that, that the example that follows of matches and lighters aren't really substances, and maybe say items. Um, items or substances. Actually, Ms. Thanger, I was just gonna recommend getting rid of that. Um, you can water so many things to death and I don't think every single thing needs to be in a policy. I don't, I just don't see that needs to be. Either. Number seven, McKenna. Yeah, sorry, where are you? Seven, principal may authorize lawful use of substances. Okay. Um, so do you wanna, delete the whole thing or add the items? I personally would like to delete the whole thing unless somebody can give me a compelling reason to keep it. And it seems to me that if, a, if there's a chemistry project that requires fire or matches or lighters that the, the teacher and principal would be supervising that and the student wouldn't need to have that on their person otherwise. So I, I don't have any problem with deleting that paragraph. I would agree, and that would be resolved um, if there were a situation that would be resolved through the investigation where the um, intention and culpability would be included. Okay, so we've covered tobacco, we've covered drugs, and alcohol. Let's talk gangs, 4328. Okay. Um, I'll jump right in. Mm -hmm. um, section B, um, under notice, um, there's a section in here, in addition to the Code of Student Conduct and um, all student handbooks, it goes on to say that the student code of conduct or other similar materials also shall provide the addresses of websites that contain additional information identifying gang signs, symbols, clothing, and other gang indicators. Um, just curious as to that requirement. Um, 
completely agree with the consultation with law enforcement um, about having gang indicators and symbols and um, all those maintained in a list of current examples that are available in the office and easily accessible to the school or anyone else who is interested. Um, I'm just a little concerned about um, the perceived advertising of websites that could um, further instruct curious students on gang signs, symbols, um, being in the code of um, student conduct. So wondering about the requirement on that. That's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. So the require, if you're going to punish a kid for wearing some sort of gang sign or symbol or expressing some sort of gang symbol, they have to be on notice that that is in fact a gang sign or symbol. So you have to give them notice somehow of what you're considering to be gang signs and symbols. Mm -hmm. Could that be addressed um, more appropriately through the range of consequences where first offense is, um, is clarification and instruction on what that is. And then um, so that, I mean, first offense is, is an instructional opportunity anyway. Could that be handled through range of consequences as opposed to publicizing websites? So the policy does actually say before disciplinary consequences for like wearing a gang sign, they're going to receive an individualized warning that the conduct mm -hmm. violation. Um, Deborah, do you, what do you think about not giving? Well, yeah, so I mean, the, um, the case, you know, that was in the North Carolina courts uh, that really defined and struck down as unconstitutional a gang policy that was uh, unconstitutionally vague because it didn't give students notice of what clothing and symbols and behavior was prohibited. So I don't have a problem with not putting it on, you know, advertising on websites as long as there are other methods for uh, appropriate notice. And it could be that, um, I mean, I think that whole paragraph B is about notice and, and those, those notices need to be updated regularly. You can't necessarily do that by reprinting the student code of conduct. So that requires the, having the list in the school, system, uh, in the school um, administrative office or somewhere in the school. So, you know, I'm, I'm fine to delete that last sentence about websites as long as the other uh, areas of notice are are maintained up to date um, and it could be that it's just in the code of student conduct and there's a link to the new hanover county schools site that has the updated list so a student could easily get to it um, and see if there are any changes made and that would be a central place where it could be um, maintained up to date does that address the concern julie so, yeah. I think the, the whole notice piece is, is interesting to me. Um, just as I recall as a, as a former principal that sometimes this information was was not something that was, was necessarily put out. And, and again, I think that that was probably a little bit more controlled by law enforcement, but I understand that if it has to be in policy, um, it has to be there. I just, I didn't know if there was any, um, you know, do, do we allow like local law enforcement to, to look at this as well in regards to is this what they would typically um, recommend? Um, and then the other thing I, I see is, is that it kind of looks like the, the, the principal becomes the uh, the expert on this where I'm not sure law enforcement wouldn't be the expert. But, I, but again, I'm just putting that out for discussion. No, I think that this definitely anticipates that principals um, or other school administrators will be in, in frequent contact with law enforcement to understand what the most up-to-date um, symbols are. Um, that's, I don't think there's any expectation that principals are, are somehow going to be able to determine this without law enforcement. And McKenna, maybe you can point to where that, I'm not finding it right now. I thought I saw it in the policy. <laughs> The first sentence of section B says that the superintendent or designee shall regularly consult with law for enforcement officials to maintain current examples. So that what the principals are gonna be maintaining in their office 
is what they're going to be getting from the superintendent who has conferred with law enforcement to keep that up to date. Yes, and we do that. Um, and, and so I feel like that part is, is covered. Um, and there was one section, I was wondering if we want to refer to our, um, well, actually, never mind. I think it probably is best to leave it with con consulting with law enforcement officials. We have that more specifically defined in our SRO MOU, but I think um, the way it's worded here is, is fine. So is that correct the way uh, the sentence I deleted? That's what we agreed on? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything for 4328? How, how would you um, keep the record of whether their student had been previously um, counseled on um, the violation? Uh, those would go into our um, student discipline and intervention system called Educator Handbook. And so um, all infractions, small or you know, minor or serious, um, go into Educator Handbook. And um, the more serious required reportable infractions feed into Power School discipline data. But um, all interventions and um, any kind of corrections or counseling for infractions goes into that system. Okay, so all administrators and teachers would know that. Is that correct? They have um, been trained on that, and that is an expectation, yes. And it is in writing in their handbook? So the... Um, we were talking about this actually this week. Um, the code of conduct or student handbook um, has really thus far consisted of policy 8410 and um, the implementation of these or adoption of these policies will create a different standard of a code of conduct handbook and those would be included. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, we can move that one forward. Uh, committee members, it is 11.32. This meeting is scheduled to go until 12 noon. Um, and I would like to be respectful of everybody's time. I know there's a board meeting to prepare for tonight. So I don't think we're going to get through all of these. But if it's all right with everybody, we will go until 12 o'clock. And then you guys can prepare or not prepare. But um, I do want to be respectful of people's time. Three hours is a very long meeting. So unless there are any objections, that will be my plan to end the meeting at uh, 12 o'clock. All right. Um, so moving on to 4330 theft, trespass, and damage to property. I just have to say we are dealing with a lot of fun topics today. Welcome to my world. Welcome to my everyday. <laughs> I, I, I'm really getting a, a ground level perspective of, <laughs> of just how difficult your job must be. <laughs> this is when I'm not paying attention to COVID. Um, <laughs> so on this one, 4330, my only um, concern is under A3 trespass B. Um, with a student is loiter loitering at any school after the close of the school day without any specific need or supervision. Um, I wonder if we can put something in there that we're rolling out a transportation issue. Um, because at, at any high school, you're going to find kids just hanging around and many are waiting until a parent or somebody else gets off work or an older sibling to come by and get them. Um, I just want to rule out a transportation issue so that we're not immediately considering that to be a trespass. I'm going to say without any specific needs, such as waiting for transportation. Sure. If that works for everybody. That works for me. Mm -hmm. and then actually to make that more clear, why don't I move without any supervision or a specific need? Just because it, the clause makes it unclear then. That, Thank you. 
I don't have anything else for this one. I didn't have anything for this one, Ms. Nichols. No, thank you. Did anybody have anything here? Oh, 4331. I'm good on that one. I don't have anything. I didn't really have anything here. Okay, 4333. Weapons, bomb threats, terrorist threats, and clear threats to safety. I don't have any suggestions on this one either. Very clear cut. No, I'm, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Uh, use of unmanned aircraft drones um, way out of my wheelhouse. So, uh, Ms. Brinson, um, uh, Ms. Varnum, I'm sure you guys can talk us through this. I'm, I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Brinson. It's out of my wheelhouse too. Um, so I've read through this and compared it with the draft one we did um, last year. And it seems to, it's very thorough and it seems to cover everything. Um, just wanted to be sure everybody was aware though. We do have a class at Ashley High School where um, through CTE program where they are teaching how to fly drones. So that is a CTE course now, but this does cover, it's covering all the FAA guidelines. Um, so this is very thorough. So um, I actually did have a few comments if that's all right on this one. Um, the number um, item B, it says must be approved in writing by the superintendent or designee. And I would just want to be sure that there is a process has developed, it doesn't have to be in the policy, but there really does need to be a process for approval. Um, and it doesn't, you know, doesn't specify what that is. Then further down, um, second paragraph on the next page, may be required to provide proof of insurance. Um, and I don't know if anyone is conferred with risk management about this. I would be, um, I would, I would certainly recommend that insurance be required as part of the process of authorizing use and not leave it to be discretionary. Um, and then I would want to talk to risk management about any potential liability issues and whether or not uh, coverage might be necessary, whether the school's um, coverage would protect the district if there were some issue, what level of coverage needs to be required. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't studied what the potential harm is, but I can certainly imagine a drone flying into someone's car and causing damage or, um, or hitting someone potentially, or you might have privacy issues if someone is photographing with a drone and you might have a tort claim for someone's invasion of privacy. I just, I do think that there are some issues of liability that should be addressed um, and maybe getting risk management involved would be a good um, consideration. Uh, then the next provision, the policy really just assumes that commercial or recreational use will be allowed. And I think the board has the opportunity or the ability to determine that you will only allow drone use for educational or instructional purposes. And 
not give permission to use them for commercial or recreational purposes on school grounds. Um, that's a discussion that I think that, that the board needs to have and make and, and the policy committee should have first and make it. Um, so you certainly have the authority to say, we will allow it for instructional use for commercial purposes. And um, obviously recognizing that someone who is not on school grounds and has permission from the FAA may be able to fly over school property and you don't have control over that, but whether or not you have to affirmatively give permission for someone to use it for commercial purposes is something that I would recommend you, you make a conscious decision about doing or not doing. So let's put this one on hold, Mr. Bowyer. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll let you know that as far as the insurance, I do remember um, we did talk about the insurance. Um, I know that the Mary Hazel on, I'm not sure if she was in on the discussions, um, it may have been before um, that came underneath her, but I believe we are covered by insurance. It's just definitely something we can kind of check into with risk management to make sure, because we did have this discussion. Um, I want to say, I don't even think it was last year, it may have been the year before last year. It all seems to blur right now. That was before my time, but I'll double check with Julie. Yeah. Hey, good morning. This is Eddie Anderson. Um, we also, many of our contractors, they may be designers, engineers, architects, or uh, the contractors, uh, when we have sites under construction or renovation, um, they're using drones more and more. And, um, and we have allowed that with our permission. Um, so if, if that could be included in the policy, um, it would be helpful. Yeah, the way this was um, written, that was one of the things that we were anticipating was that contractors were going to want to do it or something like you have a leak on your roof. Sometimes the roofing company might send a drone up to get a better look or something like that. Um, so exactly. that is it would be allowed under here. It's just, you'd have to go through the process to get permission like this says. Okay. Okay, so we're holding 43, 34. All right, Ms. Farnham, I think we're back in your territory <laughs> with <laughs> criminal behavior, 43, 35. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that criminal behavior is my territory. Yes. Yeah, there. I should. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> your, your knowledge base, not personal knowledge base, but. All good. All good. But thank you. Um, I did have a question about this one. Um, everything looks pretty standard. Um, except in section B at the very bottom of page one, where it starts with the principal or designee shall notify the superintendent or designee in writing or by email of any report made by the principal to law enforcement. And um, that, that isn't necessarily something we're, we're doing right now, um, given our presence of SROs in our buildings. Um, certainly the reportables the reportable offenses that are listed in the paragraph above are um, communicated to us. And, and so I, I didn't know if um, this needs to be the expectation uh, because it goes on to say that this will occur, you know, um, by the end of the workday in which the incident occurred and no later than the following day. So, um, and then also that the superintendent must inform the board of any such reports. And so, I don't know if we want that to be specifically just the reportables in second paragraph, or if that includes all reports to law enforcement. Ms. Farnham, could you clarify what a report to law enforcement might look like that did not involve those reportables in the above paragraph? Sure, it could be, um, it could be larceny, it could be um, a um, minor drug offense, it could be anything um, that has been communicated, could be, you know, an assault, it could be something that's, you know, on or off campus that's been shared with an administrator that won't necessarily fall into the categories above. So assault resulting in serious personal injury, the de definitions of those are pretty um, extensive in um, DPI policy, 
but you know it could be you know other acts of assault or you know fighting anything like that um, that could be an assault without a personal injury or serious injury i would think that if we could clarify that to say that those measures will be uh, undertaken you know with regards to informing the superintendent as soon as practical and making sure the board is aware uh, but just for those 10 um, listed violations, I don't think we need to be aware of, you know, every small marijuana charge or mm -hmm. this fight that doesn't involve serious injury, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Any thoughts on that, McKenna or, or Ms. Yeah, so that's fine. Um, yeah, you're only required to report those 10 listed above. So we can limit it to that. So I'll notify the superintendent. Enforcement of. And, and also, um, I guess, ask Dr. Faust if he wants to weigh in on that, if he sees that differently. I'm processing. Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I think that's fine. We just have to train our principals on it. I mean, that's the, the biggest thing because what typically has been happening is I get a letter of expulsion on my desk and then it's, have you done, it's, I won't sign it because we hadn't followed the actual policy. So I think um, we just have to make sure that we are following policy. Absolutely. So, yeah, and as long as the communication of the offenses, even prior to um, any disciplinary um, determination are communicated, um, these, these reportable 10, if others don't need to be communicated, then uh, we can just include that in professional development for those, if that's okay. Uh, I did have a quick question on section B. A school employee is permitted to report to law enforcement an assault by a student on a school employee. Um, why would such reporting not be mandatory? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure why, and, and certainly there should be a record made within the administration. I think that's referring to, and anybody else can jump in, but I see that referring to situations um, where uh, uh, an administrator has um, investigated a situation or some type of incident, and um, you know maybe that's been referred to law enforcement, and there's been no determination between law enforcement and the school administrator that that it would be an official report to law enforcement or would need to be um, documented as an official report, but then an employee may be interested in making that, that report, not from the school, but from themselves personally. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I also assume for that, so an assault, you have, ch you have young children, I mean, some kid slaps the, te like hits the teacher, varying degrees of whether that's like, is that really an assault being age of the kid? You know, I think this is just, if it's something where the teacher feels that this was, it doesn't want to limit the teacher's ability to go to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Even I, if, I, I definitely appreciate the clarification. Um, <laughs> I think if, um, yeah, if they had to report it or something, I know uh, Amanda would probably be <laughs> uh, reporting almost every day because um, these things happen. So I, I understand the clarification and I appreciate it. Is the language added okay? Is that what everyone wants? Mm -hmm. I have one of the 10 listed. Yes. I'm fine with that. Yes, and I didn't have any other questions about uh, 4335. Anybody else on 4335 going once? 
Only going once. All right, 4340, school level investigation. I don't have any concerns on this one. Mr. Bryant, Dr. Faust. None for me. None for me either. Ms. Nichols. No, thank you. 4340 is on for first reading. Forty-three, forty-one. 41 uh, parental involvement and in student issues. Ms. Farnham? I don't have any concerns with this one either. I'm Anybody? I'm good with this one. Well, uh, let's just call that a really good policy then. Mm-hmm. Forty-three, forty-two. student searches. Um, Ms. Stagner, you want to take us through some of this? Do you have anything? So I didn't have any, um, any comments on this. I think that it, it sets out the requirements. Um, I was very pleased to see that the um, changes in paragraph A4 about intrusive personal searches that would um, not allow sort of the strip search scenario that gets um, administrators and school officials in trouble. Um, I do, I did actually have a question about the record of searches um, and whether or not, I, I made a note here, on a prescribed form, if there is a record kept on a prescribed form, it looks like that came from your previous or your current policy. And I always get suspicious about <laughs> a reference to a prescribed form if they they may not be um, that may not be still be done. So I'd be interested to hear about that. Um, but otherwise, I think that it is um, it's appropriate. It states the legal standard accurately. And um, again, this is one that. Some good good training of administrators is really helpful in staying out of trouble. Um, I had a question about that prescribed form as well, <laughs> um, which you know, probably doesn't sound good. Um, but I, so, I do have a couple of other yeah. questions as well. If that's not if that's not something that's being done, I think you could delete that that paragraph um, unless there's a desire. There, there's no requirement to keep a record of every search, and, and if it's not being done consistently, I wouldn't include it in policy. Um, okay, I, I would I would agree with that. Ms. Nichols, mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Uh, that sounds good. Can I go through a couple of other questions I have with this one? Please. So it, um, back to page one in A, um, searches based on individualized reasonable suspicion. The second sentence there says this reasonable suspicion must be based on specific and articulable facts, which have been acquired through reliable and or corroborated information from employees, students, law enforcement, or other credible sources. And it goes on. I'm wondering about anonymous tips because we have our say something um, app process where uh, we receive anonymous tips on any type of concern and if that's based on uh, and we have had those based on weapon or other dangerous instruments or objects and um, I'm wondering if an anonymous tip would fit into that reasonable suspicion and would that um, lock us into not being able to respond to those. So I'll I'll respond to that Julie that the anonymous tip is not I wouldn't recommend that an anonymous, anonymous tip by itself raises to the level of an individualized reasonable suspicion that would support a search. I think that even before you had a tip line, you have to consider an anonymous tip, whether it's a handwritten note or something in the context of other information to determine whether there's enough there to support a search. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be different 
So if you get an anonymous tip that a student has a handgun on campus and there's an immediate danger and that the part of it will be looking at the um, the level of information that's provided in that tip. Is it detailed enough that you can determine that that is more reliable and it is more potentially accurate? Um, and then you weigh that with the safety uh, concerns. So specific and articulable facts. If the anonymous tip has, you know, J Jimmy in Mrs. Smith's fourth grade class um, had a, a gun in his book bag and his book bag is, um, blue with a you know race car on the front that that's some pretty specific information that you can p potentially act on if it just says um, Jimmy has something that he shouldn't have at school that's less articulable and you would not want to go and do a full-scale search based on that limited information so again this um, this paragraph states what the legal standard is, and it's going to be fact specific. And there are a million cases that that look at different fact scenarios and decide whether the search was constitutional or not. Um, and the best we can do is is that training to help administrators understand what is sufficient information to to move forward on. I think I think that makes sense regarding the specific um, and articulable facts. I think the the thing that concerned me a little bit more would be the um, considering a credible source and you know of course using an anonymous tip with any other information, whether it's detailed and weighing it with safety concerns, um, but trying to determine whether an anonymous source is a credible source, I think is probably beyond ability, but certainly aligning it with other information would be helpful. I, I think it's. You know, it's credible if the information itself in in the tip is something that can be confirmed. So you might not know who the person is, but if it is otherwise credible, you know, it's come through the tip line. It, it has information in it that that seems to make the rest of it credible. I don't know, McKenna, is that um, it, it seems to me that this language is pretty much, again, following the case law. But is there um, anything that you can add about anonymous sources? I don't know anything specifically about anonymous, but I agree with your assessment. I think that helps too. Um, and I think the explanation can be you know, supported through professional development. I think um, that's probably a, a good place to, to say that with all of these policies, I think there's gonna be considerable professional development for administrators um, required. Um, the next one, since we're still on this one. Um, the number three, pat down searches. Um, a school official may conduct a frisk or pat down search of the student's person. Um, search must be conducted in private by a school official. And it does say of the same gender with an adult witness present. I'm wondering if that should be of the same gender or gender identity. I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the suspicionless general searches down in section B, I think that um, where it says the searches must be, I think it's the second, no, third sentence, the searches must be conducted in accordance with a category, um, in accordance with standardized procedures established by the superintendent or designee. I think we'll need, um, I'd love some support in creating those procedures. Um, where then you know it, it goes through the demonstrated need. I know that doesn't require any addressing of policy. I just I'm just thinking about putting it into practice already. So do we um, have um we do we have metal detectors searches? Do we currently have them? Yes, we do. Um, we have the um, most have the wands. The wand. Okay. And, mm -hmm. Got it. We do have. Um, some of the point of entry, we have a, a, a set or two of the point of entry ones that are used more for athletic events, um, specifically okay. indoor like basketball okay, um, as needed. Um, and speaking of that, so if we go on down to that number two point of entry metal detector searches, um, because of the way that sentence starts due to the increasing problem of weapons in schools, um, I don't think our data actually shows we have an increasing problem of weapons in schools. So I'm wondering if we can just 
um, take out that first part of that sentence and just start with um, mm -hmm. school officials may use metal detectors. I like that better, much better. I agree. And then um, I would suggest um, administrative regulations for this one uh, that includes that standardized um, process. And um, if we're not going to use a form for searches, that's good. We'll take that out. But at least that standardized process for those um, suspicionless general searches. And then um, I'm curious about where shoes fall in the search criteria. If um, shoes would be a part of a more intrusive personal search. And that might be something more for um, professional development. I just, as far as implementation, I was just curious where you guys thought shoes fell in that. I have to admit, I, I, I haven't thought about that question, but that's a great, great question. Um, I'd be happy to take a look at some cases to see if there's anything about shoes and whether it falls in that line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've just seen where it falls into considering it as an undergarment and then considering it as more personal. So if we can make a determination, that'd be great. And that's all I have on that one. Okay, do we feel comfortable moving forward with this? I, I think if Deborah can send that additional information as she has done before. Okay. Um, all right, that's fine. So 43, 42 will be moved forward as well. Thank you, Ms. Varnum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is 12.02. So I will entertain a motion to go ahead and hold the remaining policies until the next policy committee meeting. So for the next policy committee meeting, do you just wanna do the remaining policies or do you want additional policies too? Um, let's add some additional policies. Okay. How many do we have left? Today, we only have uh, just six. I have six, yes. Yeah, let's um, go ahead and add some more. Uh, okay. It will be the first policy committee meeting for some of, or for two thirds of the policy committee. So just try to keep it somewhat light for them. But yeah, let's go ahead and add those. Does this series go all the way up to, is it 9,000? Yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> wow, okay. The eights and the nines are real short though, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think this, the student and the personnel, the personnel's in seven, those will be very heavy, but other than that, the, the rest shouldn't be quite as onerous. Do we need a motion to put these forward for first reading? I believe that's what you've been doing is to, to have a, a motion for all of those that are going forward for first reading. Okay, so at this time, I will entertain a motion to put all the policies forward for first reading with the exception of policies 4370, 4362, 45, or 4353, 4352, 4351, 4345, 3445, 3416, and 4334. And, and also, um, I think 3620 is being, is that being held? Um, That's correct. I'm sorry, 3620 as well. Moved. I will second. Ms. Nichols, how do you vote? Aye. 
I will vote aye. The motion is agreed to. Uh, I do want to thank everybody um, for all the work this year. This will be our last policy committee meeting of the year, but I really appreciate uh, all the effort you guys have put in. And Ms. Nichols, again, uh, thank you very, very much for everything you've done because we're going to Six, miss your service. Years. <laughs> 16 years. Uh -huh. uh, I look forward to seeing you tonight. And uh, I can on policy, you. yeah. I congratulate you on all your success and all your accomplishments. And I'm going to miss everyone. We'll miss you right back. Um, and with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Well, I'll go ahead and second. Miss <laughs> um, Nichols, how do you vote? Aye. I will, I will also vote aye. Uh, and again, if I don't see some of you, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. McKenna, I'll wish you a Merry Christmas. Everybody else, I'll probably see you a hundred times. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, all. Thank you all. Stay well. Thank you. Thanks, all.